Wow, right, um, thank you. That was uh, so Sarafir Karishi. Um, thanks for kicking off the event. Um, a big welcome from Cambridge and to everybody to what must be the world's first um, celebration of stammering. Um, of course, we're, um, we're broadcasting on Zoom now. Um, however, um, later uh, the recording of the event will be going on to Facebook and also on to YouTube as well. Uh, more details will be in the chat box. Okay, um, the Cambridge Stammering Group um, is very blessed to have uh, many inspirational me members. Um, you will have seen um, some of the beautiful portraits by um, Paul Aston, um, and you've most likely read um, um, Stammering Pride and Prejudice, which is um, co-edited by um, Patrick Campbell. Um, and uh, together with books, recent books by um, Helen Rutter and John T. Claypole, um, we've been inspired to um, celebrate stammering, celebrate the diversity of our stammers and also celebrate people who stammer as well. So this afternoon, you're going to be hearing from writers, artists, comedians, actors, musicians, cartoonists, poets, and to name but a few. Uh, the full program um, of this afternoon will be on the Eventbrite um, website. Um, and um, today we'll be tweeting from the, uh, the Cam Stammering um, Twitter account and we'll be using the hashtag Celebrate Stammering. Again, all of that information you can find in the chat box now. Um, you'll have no noticed that 
um, we've uh, muted your microphones and your cameras. However, you can still use the Q&A function um, to ask questions to our um, panelists and also to the keynote, uh, keynote speakers as well. Okay, um, please also um, tweet any com comments you want to as well. I don't think we've got any safeguarding issues here, but if you've got any um, concerns, um, please get in touch by email. Again, the email's in the chat box, okay? A um, couple of big thanks, first of all, to 21 Digital for producing the fantastic artwork that we've been seeing on our social me media content recently, and also uh, Rian Bins and YPO for organizing the broadcasting of the event this afternoon. Okay, um, so you will have seen the schedule um, and we should, be we should be concluding at about five o'clock. However, please note um, these timings are only approximate. We all stammer. Um, and there might be a few um, technical hiccups along the way, but um, I'm sure it's gonna be a wonderful event. Um, as the event is free, we've decided to set up um, a Just Giving page and to collect uh, money for um, stammering charities in the UK and Africa as well. Um, I've now got a couple of um, short videos to show you. Uh, the videos will be coming soon. Um. Imagine you're 15 and you stammer. You love Ed Sheeran and Emily Blunt. Not that long ago, you were amazed by Lewis Carroll's stories. But according to articles and stories online, these people are plagued by a terrible impediment which they had to get rid of. When all they did was stammer, a physical condition that few of us stop to think about, yet one in 100 people have. So we worked together with the community at Wikipedia and carefully rewrote every bit of language that spoke of it in a damaging or false way. There shouldn't be shame in having a stammer, whether you're 15 or 65. It's how we talk. And now there's also another video coming up from the African Stuttering Centre. <laughs> School students in East Africa are being mistreated for having a stutter as their teachers do not know enough about the issue of the coordinator of the African Stuttering Centre, says bullying and physical punishment badly affect the child who stutters, especially in a learning environment. Diaduni stutters and was a victim of these practices when he was a child. He developed an initiative to stop victimisation of children who stutter in school. He and his team provide resources to teachers to better assist these students. Please consider supporting this great initiative. Your support ensures educational material available through it remains free to all. Every child matters. Let's promote the rights of every child who stutters. Thanks a lot for watching this video. And welcome to the, to the celebration of stammering and the art stammer. My name is Jason Simon. I'm a Rwandan. Because stuttering is stigmatized in Africa, I became an activist to fight for the life of the people of stutter, especially the young children. I invite each of you to join this fight. Together, we can end the bullying and victimization of the school students to stutter. 
let's promote let's promote the light of whatever trade of data thanks thank you very very much for stammer in the uk and uh, the african center for stuttering and for sending in those videos and um, details of how to donate um, are in the chat box now and they'll also be on our facebook and uh, twitter pages okay so let's get the celebration of stammering started with our keynote speakers and i'll hand you over to a familiar face to many of you um, patrick campbell Hello there, everybody. It's really good to, 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 to be here to, to today for a very special and exciting day. I know that some people are struggling to get into to the room and we seem to have reached full capacity, but we're working on sorting that out. So hopefully that'll be solved soon. In the meantime, we all get treated to an extra special. Um, we're going to have some 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 new, new, new voices here to, to, today and some old ones and I'm very excited to be welcoming a new voice to us from across uh, across 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 the pond I first heard him in 2020 on the um, American podcast this American life for 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 one of the most interesting discussions of stammering in popular media I I've, 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 I've heard. So this is Jerome Ellis. He's a composer, poet, and performer. His current practice explores blackness, music, and disabled speech as forces of refusal, ref, 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 refusal and healing. I'm very excited to introduce Jerome Ellis. Over to you, Jerome. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, where I am, it's morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, I feel very honored uh, and grateful to be here with, with you all. Um, I'm wondering if someone might be able to enable my screen sharing, if possible. Um, I wanted to share some music if that's um yeah sure just two minutes jerome i'll do that for you oh thank you so much for your no rush thank you you should um, be host now so hopefully oh, you'll good. be able to share um let me know though if you've had any problems thank you i've got it now thank you so much um <clears throat> i'm i'm in in the city of of Virginia Beach in the state of Virginia in the United States. And um, I'm with my, I'm with my, I'm with my, with my parents and I'm in, in my childhood room and um, and my childhood room overlooks a, a park and there's a basketball court and um, I'm going to speak a little bit about that shortly but first I wanted to, wanted to, uh, to share some music so let me see if this will work here see. Yes, Nicole, I also love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a beautiful view. Okay, I'm going to play, I'm going to start this music very quiet. And then wondering if someone could tell me when it's reached a good volume. I don't want to, I don't want to overwhelm uh, people's ears. I'll start this here.
Are you all hearing the music?
Thank you all so much for your very kind words in the chat. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start with that um, music um, because um, in my um, life and in my art practice, I try to use music to um, investigate um, uh, investigate um, the experience of stuttering, the experiences of stuttering, because of course it's never singular. Um, and um, I find music to be a very useful um, tool of investigation and research um, because of its relationship to um, time. Um, because I've I've been I've studied ever since I was very little, and maybe maybe four or five. Um, and, but it was only in very recent years, maybe in the last two years or so that, um, I was, I started thinking about stuttering in, in relationship to, to time and the ways that it, um, the ways that it, uh, opens, and stretches and dilates time. And of course, um, the forms of um, suffering that I've experienced and that other, other people who stutter experience where it feels that time is perhaps not as accessible for them as it should be. Um, and so in this piece, um, as you heard, so there's, you know, this, this underlying sort of bed of sound. Um, and, and then there's a saxophone on top. And um, I created the, the bed of sound first. And the way I did it was I, I took an old an old recording of mine. Um, I don't even remember what instruments I was playing on the recording, maybe, maybe a piano, as well as saxophone. What I did was I used a computer program and slowed down that original music and slowed it down so much that it 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 stretched. It it stretched like like. It stretched like taffy, you know, um, and stretched so much that it became this, yeah, this this bed. And the original recording, it probably had, you know, some kind of some kind of a a beat to it, you know, as as a lot of music does. It has a beat, you know, it has a has a steady rhythm. But as you notice in this music, there was no there was no beat. Um, in that sense. And that was intentional because what I was seeking to do was to create a a create a kind of space and a, and time where um, where there is no um, there is not the kind of forward motion that you have in other other kinds of music. Um, and part of why that, when I, when I listen to music like that, when I make music like that, it's very soothing for me. Um, and I think part of it has to do with, um, but it, it, part of it has to do with, I think my experience, um, 
my my experience with stuttering because a very common feeling that I have had throughout my life is that <clears throat> I'm in a conversation with someone and I know the rhythm at which I should speak, but I can't do that. I can't match it. And so there's this feeling that, oh, oh, the clock is ticking and there's this beat that is going on and I'm not able to speak in the rhythm that I need to. And I think, I think other stutters perhaps have this experience where you, you know, you, you know what, what, what you need, you know what you, what you would, you, you, you should say in the way in which you, you should say it. Um, but you cannot do that. And to me, it's a, it's a musical thing that I, that there's growing up, I would experience many moments where there were certain rhythms and cadences in conversation that I could not um, match as if my my body or even my 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 vocal my vocal cords is an instrument but I couldn't play the music on the instrument and I mentioned this basketball court that I'm looking at right now um, and I remember sometimes there would be kids at the park playing basketball um, and I would sometimes go over and try to play with them and um, I was not very good um, at basketball, um, but I would, I would try to play anyway. But I remember many moments where I would try to, where I, I heard the cadences and the rhythms that they were speaking, especially, um, especially the boys who were black, there were certain patterns um, of African American speech that I could hear that I knew in my mind how to how to match those rhythms, but I couldn't with my speech. And I I I, I often felt a sense of subtle or not so subtle exclusion um, because of that. Um, uh, I was very touched and very. Um, inspired seeing the video um, with 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 the African um, activist um, uh, that experience that is is described in the video is very familiar to me um, as I'm, I'm sure it is it's many other people who stutter but this experience, this this feeling of of exclusion, <clears throat> again for me had a a rhythmic and a, a musical aspect to it that that the message I was receiving was that you can't play this music, and so you're not allowed. You know, um, uh, that was very painful. Um, and I, I started playing the saxophone when I was 13 and I would, I learned it very much in this, in this room here and practiced a lot, um, and started playing the piano at 15 and started working with, with electronic music, um, a bit later in university. And gradually over time, I, I began to I mean, immediately when I started playing the saxophone, I immediately, you know, I, I, I realized that, oh, here is a, here is some, here is a form of expression that I can use that, um, it bypasses speech and there are certain forms of fluency that I can achieve on the saxophone that I can't by speaking. Though, interestingly, I do stutter sometimes when I play saxophone. Um, in trying to articulate um, a, a note. But eventually I started writing my own music. And what I started to realize slowly was that writing music was a way not just of, ex of expressing myself, but literally to um, shape time. 
and to create time environments in which I feel good because at the basketball court, that was a time environment when I often did not feel good in most areas of, of, of life. So, um, so as I said earlier, the underlying bed of sound I created by slowing, slowing something down. And I think um, it's a method that I use often in, in my music. I'll, I'll record something and then slow it way down. And I think there's something um, analogous there to um, the feeling of stuttering because often when I stutter, of course, I often have the feeling that I am slowing time down and that it is uncomfortable um, <clears throat> and that I fear that I'm holding people up. You know, I'm in, in line at, at, at a fast food place and they ask me my name and I'm stuttering my name and the line is growing behind me and I'm, I'm sweating, you know, I feel that I'm, you know, slowing time down and it doesn't feel very good. But over time, I've been able to, you know, um, look at it from a different viewpoint um, and seeing beauty and power and um, a gift in, in that experience of slowing things down. And then I, <clears throat> in the music, then I get a very, um, you know, a very, um, I get a, a kind of a demonstration of this when I literally slow down the sounds and it creates new sounds. Because then that leads me to ask, well, when, when we, um, as people who stammer, when we stammer, um, what, what new, new things are we are we opening up uh for those around us um, um and it is in in fact a a gift you know um uh i sometimes call this a clearing um i sometimes use the image of a clearing when i'm speaking about this um that sometimes when I'm stammering with someone that it feels like in the moment of the stammer that a clearing opens up and that some, and that it becomes a space of a possibility. Like at the fast food um, restaurant, you know, I have had many moments where um, I'm stuttering on my name and the person at the cash register is like so patient and so kind and they'll just wait. And it's a very special moment. It's like, I don't know if they know, if they understand what's happening. Um, it doesn't really matter to me, but we, we just like, we're, it's like a, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah, like a, a clearing or like um, this kind of like, um, air pocket that opens where it's just like we're then just like two people standing in silence um, in the midst of all you know all these hamburgers um, on the grill and, and people's voices and things like that um, so um, I'll, I'll lastly also just say about the music is that um, as people may have recognized, I was playing the hymn, His Eyes on the Sparrow, um, um, as a tribute to my grandfather who, who died last year. Um, but then once I'm done with the hymn, then I start playing other music, and that music was improvised um, and um, and Nicole you mentioned in the chat you mentioned her jazz earlier and jazz was 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 the first music that I 
really studied on the saxophone and it remains very central to me. And what, when I learned about improvisation, when I was learning the saxophone, it was, it was huge because I, 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 I felt extremely liberated that you could just make things up, um, that you didn't have to, you know, I, I played in the school band and I would have my sheet music but I didn't know that you could also, that there was another way of making music where you could just compose the music on the spot. Um, and I think that that also really connected for me with my experience of stuttering. I think other, other people who stutter have this experience too, is that we, we become very adept at certain forms of improvising, whether it's finding and finding a synonym in the moment or, you know, totally restructuring your, your sentence, you know, um, if you encounter a word that, that doesn't want to speak. Um, and I think improvisation is, is really, for me, is really, is really um, useful um, as a way of, of being in a way of moving through life not just in my speaking and not just in my music. Um, and, and so, in, and so in, 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 in my music, I often explore it. And um, it becomes another way I think of healing, of finding healing in, in time, because when I'm improvising, I'm very, I'm in the moment in a way that I, that, um, um, is different than if I already know what I'm gonna play. And so in, in the first half of the piece, when I'm playing the melody for His Eyes on the Sparrow, I know the melody very well. Um, and I'm still in the moment playing it, but once I stopped the melody and then I, and then I said, oh, I, th I think I wanna keep playing, then, then I enter into another place. Um, so, um, And I, I wanted to end by saying that when, 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 when Patrick uh, very kindly invited me to speak here, um, I, um, I would I, I I I for the past few weeks have been trying to think about what I want to, to talk about ideas, but ultimately what I decided was that I would was that I would improvise my 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 way through what I want to 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 say um, as a way of honoring that as well a way of honoring that as a way of being. Um, so, thank you. <laughs> Jerome, thank you for that. That was really beautiful and meditative. I really liked the, the, the music and then your kind of embodied improvisation around that, reflecting on the music as well. It was really beautiful and some really... Um, really sort of transcendent thoughts in there around stammering and space and um different ways of finding space for 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 our voices through art and different media there's lots of concepts in there we're encouraging people after each person speaks to write in the q, q, q a for for, for questions. Um, the first two questions we got, Jerome, were, were asking where people can, can, can get your mu 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 music from so they can use it themselves. Um, but moving into sort of um, actual questions. So um, Sipple has asked, how does music feature to, 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 to support your everyday communicating with a stammer and helping to understand your your 
your your your stammer. Jerome, I can't hear you too clearly, but I'm in that awkward position where I don't know if it's me or <laughs> to you. How's this, Patrick? Much better. Yeah? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll give my website later. That's where I can get, um, that's where, where people can hear more music um but for the um the question about yeah how do i use music i mean i definitely use it to um to definitely like to just like like recover from time uh from from like being being in time like i like that piece that i played i'll just like listen to that whether like literally i'll be in the, in the bathtub or i'll treat it like being in the in the the bath like someone mentioned a spa um in the chat and i like just like sink into the music as a way of just like stepping back from um having to navigate time with my speech um so i definitely use it that way uh like I, like when i'm making music i'm primarily making it making it making it for myself as well. Um, like I make things that, that make me feel good. Um, uh, and, I, and, and there was another part of the question that was like, how do I use it in order to, in order to understand my, my stammer? I think I also, um, yeah, I mean, so many ways. I'll, I'll, I'll just say one, which is that I um, uh, recently have been using a method of making music that is called granular a granular synthesis and what it does is similarly to how i was explaining how i slow down the music what i do is i load in into a computer program, I load in a, a recording, and then I can isolate, I can go to a specific second of the recording and then sort of explode it and make new music by, basically it turns the recording into little snippets of sound that are called grains. And then I can rearrange the grains and make new music from that. And I do that, and while I'm doing that, it really helps me sort of think through a lot of um things about like i mean time but like and how finding other ways of inhabiting time mm -hmm. and, and 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 moving through time and which includes dealing with history um um and cycles and seasons and things like that and that all helps me understand my 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 stammer because because stammering it it, it prevents me from um, it, it prevents me from it prevents me from subscribing to a linear model of, of, of time because I can't adhere to the line that um, the line that line that fluency asks of me i have to find other ways of moving through it so. i think i think that you've talked before about how stammering challenges the normal temporal expectations of society and how it kind of refuses them and fight fights against them which is a really beautiful concept we've had we've had two, two people wanting to ask a similar 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 question which is um, when you were talking, you mentioned that you sometimes stammer when you're playing the this, the this saxophone, and people are wondering how that feels and what's that like as an as an experience. Yeah, it's so it's so unique. 
Um, I remember first noticing it when I would be in private lessons as a teenager with my teacher and we, he would be next to me and we were going to play a duet and he would count off and we would start to start the piece and I just, and I wouldn't start it. And I, it was really embarrassing and I didn't really, and I, at that age, I didn't know how to explain to people that I stuttered and and even less, I didn't know how to explain to him that I was studying while playing the saxophone. It seemed to me very strange. And I, I truly just didn't have any, I felt, I felt ashamed, certainly, and embarrassed. And I didn't know how to explain it. Um, so, but nowadays when it happens, I mean, that's largely why, well, nowadays when it happens, um, uh, It can be frustrating, but the way that I usually deal with it is by creating music like the music you heard earlier, where part of the, the reason, part of the, the effect of not having a beat is that it doesn't matter when I start when I start the note. You know what I mean? Like it's like because because there's no rhythm, it's just like I can start the note now or I can start it in in five seconds. And it it's it's I create, I create an environment where, I create an environment where that's okay. Um, and so that's one way that I, it's like, it's kind of like, um, there's this, I, I think there's this passage from the, passage from, uh, this passage, this, this passage from Tuang Tzu, um, of the Chinese philosopher. And I think the images of like, a, like, a, it's of like a bull and that there's a very, the bull ha, um, is surrounded by a fence, but it's a really small um, area within the fence. And the bull is really angry because it's trying to get out. And then there's another image that he offers of just like a bull and, in a very wide field that also has a fence, but it's much wider. And he says like, and I think he uses it as an image for the, the mind, but to me, it speaks, it speaks to this experience, which is like in a lot of music, like when I was growing up playing in the school band, if I, I would um, stutter, like, because I would have to come in, I would have to start playing at measure 60. And, and if I miss that point, then, then it was wrong and I grew up playing music like that and and to me the what I like to create is music that is that wider field where it's very hard hard to be wrong um, yeah music which has space for stammering in it and space yes. for stammering to add to that music yes exactly in the sense that in this event right now I feel that I'm in that open field where like if I stammer it doesn't matter and, it, and it's embraced and accepted. Whereas when I'm in the line at Starbucks, that feels like like feels like the smaller field. You know what I mean? Sadly, Judge Jerome, temporal expectations still apply to all of us. So, yeah. I, so I think that this is going to be our last question. Um, if you've got time afterwards, you can go on the Q&A and type answers because there's some really great, 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 great questions. There. I'm going to ask one which is a little bit off topic, but one I, I've been really uh, wanting to ask as well. Where did the idea for, for using multiple J's in your first name come from? Um, and Connor also adds, do you visualize it like this when you aren't in stammering forums and spaces? And he says it's a really powerful way of owning your stammer. So if you can just speak to um, your style of spelling your name. Yeah, I love this question. Um, I started it um, in J June of last year and I was really nervous about it. Um, and I was like, oh, is this gonna like mess people up and is it gonna be like a hassle to type? And I noticed myself having those thoughts and I was like, well, those are very similar to the thoughts that I have when I'm in the line, when I'm like, oh, am I holding these people up? And my response to both was like, well, I, I have the right 
to stammer in this lie, and I have the right to ask for more time, even in the rendering of, of, of my name. Um, but it's very much inspired by several by several by several black black artists, um, mainly women. Uh, Bell Hooks is the first, when I encountered Bell Hooks the spelling of her name in college, that was the first time that I had noticed an artist spelling their name in, an, um, in a, a way that, um, that stood out to me. Um, and Prince's symbol, um, there's the poet, M. Norbessi Philip, who in Norbessi, she capitalizes the S. And I have a very dear friend who is a, a Black woman, um, is a, a choreographer and a director and a writer and a performer. Um, named Nikki, and Nikki spells her name lowercase n, lowercase i, lowercase c, a capital H, lowercase i. And so I was noticing this practice in these artists that I admire, and I, you know, like we, you used the word refusal earlier, uh, Patrick, and I see them as practices of refusal to like refusal to abide by um, standard orthography, which black people in the diaspora I see do in so many ways um, in spoken language as well, um, creating new forms of, 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 of grammar that that are English, but but that that approach English huh, from another angle. And my parents are West Indian, and and they and they speak different forms of of West Indian English. So I see it as an intervention in language, this language is a sphere where I, where I have experienced so much pain and where so much of us have experienced so much pain, whether we stutter or for many other reasons and trying to um, throw a wrench into language um, and slow it down. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's a beautiful thought to end on. And just kind of piggyback on that, we are, we are kind of um, in 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 this event operating in that air pocket of stammering time. So although we've listed when when specific times might happen, depending on disfluencies, things might be pushed back a little bit. And I think we are running a little bit behind schedule, but that's fine. We're just in this air pocket of stammering. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Captain Jim Jim Jimmy Lang, who I think. Most of us know to introduce John T. Clare Paul, our next speaker. Hi there, guys. How are you doing? And that was an absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you very much, Jerome. I really enjoyed that. Now, I'm proud and privileged uh, to announce that the next keynote speaker who spent 10 years as a programme maker with BBC Arts Department and the last seven years as BBC's Director of Arts. He's also the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Arts Centre Home in Manchester, as well as Patron of Manchester's Young Identity. In 2012, he was nominated for Best Specialist Factual at the BAFTA TV Awards, and he was recently awarded an MBE for creating the Culture in Quarantine Virtual Festival of Arts. He's also named in the Bookseller 150, 
a list of the most influential people in publishing and has a new book, Words Fail Us, in defense of fluency, which argues that our obsession with fluency can be hindering rather than helping our creativity, our authenticity and persuasiveness and exploring other speech conditions such as asphasia and Tourette's. And it tells stories of the creatively disfluent, I love that, from Lewis Carroll to Kendrick Lamar. The book explains why it's time for us to stop making sense, get tongue-tied and embrace the life-changing power of inarticulacy. So a big warm, a big warm welcome to the new Stammer patron, Mr. John T. Claypole, MBE. Over to you, John T. Thanks, Jimmy. I'm, I'm not, uh, I've been, apparently I'm not able to start my video. The host has stopped. Oh, here we are. There's my, there's my video. Great. Um, can you see me now just before I start? Jimmy, can you, or Patrick, can you let me know if the video is yes, working? Yes, I can see you here yet. Great, great, great. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for that uh, uh, introduction. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about my interest in stuttering and the arts and, and, and what I've learned from studying it. Uh, I'm going to argue that people who stutter tend to be more creative than neurotypical people, that this enhanced creativity often leads us to art making, hence the killer list of great artists and writers and performers who stutter, that stuttering not only motivates us but informs the source of art we make, and that within this is a tendency to experiment, to mess about with language and form, in short, to innovate. And I think hearing from Jerome for the last half hour has really reinforced that, that point uh, for me. Uh, and finally, that, that this stutter culture isn't just some fringe minority concern that sits unrecognized at the, at the heart of mainstream culture today. I'm gonna do all that in 20 minutes, I hope. Um, but to, to explain why I'm interested in this and how I became interested, I'm going to start by taking us back to 1988. Uh, 1988 was not a great year to be a 12 year old kid who stutters in the UK. One of the top uh, selling singles was the stutter app, which half the kids in my class had. Interviewers turn away who wants to be covered in spray, rapped Morris Minor and the majors. This was in the top 10. Uh, talking to me for more than an hour is equivalent to an April shower. Um, Britain had its biggest success, uh, cinema success in years with the comedy of, uh, A Fish Called Wanda. Uh, much of the humour derived from, from the suffering of a hapless, stuttering and spluttering character called Ken. And open all hours seem to be on permanent repeat on television with David Jason's Granville forever mocking Ronnie Barker's Arkwright because of his stutter. Oh yeah, and my mum had just published an article about my stutter for Good Housekeeping magazine using this photograph of me with a bowl haircut and NHS specs uh, uh, in therapy. Uh, in fact, the person I'm talking to is the legendary uh, speech therapist, uh, Lena R Rushton, who um, was the founder of the, what became the Michael Palin Center for Stuttering Kids. Anyway, that picture and that article, not great for the cool stakes when I was um, 12. So it, it's fair to say that in 1988, I wasn't really in the mood for talking about my stutter. According to the cultural establishment, it was inherently hilarious and fair game for a laugh. That, that was evident by the films and uh, music. So it was something best kept to myself as much as possible. I found with speech therapy, this, this secretive behavior was just about manageable. As long as I didn't say particular words, avoided certain situations, limited my hobbies, and chose a career that didn't involve too much speaking, basically as long as I constructed my entire life around avoiding stuttering, I would be just about fine. Uh, roll forward 20 years to 2010, and not a great deal had changed. Uh, I still did a fairly effective job of hiding my stutter through endless avoidance tactics. I was still in, a, in and out of therapy, and I still didn't talk about it or try to understand what stuttering was because I felt it was in, inherently shameful. Then something happened. I was doing City Lips course for interiorized stammering, uh, I think some of you on uh, uh, today also have, have done that, that course. 
uh, which use techniques like voluntary stuttering to address the negative associations and avoidance behavior. There was a great emphasis on maintaining eye contact while stuttering in conversation. I realized not only had I never looked at somebody in the moment of stuttering, but I had never really looked at stuttering itself. What I mean is at the age then, 35, I couldn't tell you anything about the history of how stuttering has been treated, how it's been perceived in our culture, how phenom phenomenally creative people who stutter often are, or any of the latest research into the neuroscience of stuttering. In other words, I was very good at fretting and losing sleep about my stutter, but hopeless at analyzing or speaking about it. Like any bad relationship, it was emotionally shallow, a, a waste of energy. I started to write my book, Words Fail Us in Defense of Disfluency, to make sense of these things for myself. I wanted to understand the history and the science of stuttering. And gradually, I came to see stuttering as a cultural phenomenon as much as a physiological one. In other words, there's, what's happened, there's what happens in our mouths and what the rest of the world thinks about, which is uh, generally negative. It begins with the terminology. It seemed to me that all the words which describe stuttering tend to be formed by taking a positive term and sticking a negative prefix on it. Disorder, disfluency. Then there's the way stuttering was presented in culture. At its worst, it's the stutter rap and the fish called Wanda. At its best, it's a plot device. George VI in The King's Speech and a recent example, Simon and Bridgerton, overcome their stammers to achieve more fulfilling lives. And while they are dignified characters, unlike Ronnie Barker's Arkwright, they're only dignified once they've overcome their impediment. And so these more serious representations of stuttering are actually no less toxic. At the, at the time I was thinking about all this, I'd become director of arts at the BBC. While I'm not a scientist, I thought one useful thing I could do would be to use my expertise to understand better the relationship between stuttering and the arts. I don't mean how it is portrayed by the arts because I was pretty convinced by then that it was nearly always negative crap, chief laughs and crummy plot devices. What I was really interested in was the growing list I was making of extraordinarily creative people who stuttered. Writers like Lewis Carroll, Henry James, Elizabeth Byrne, Somerset Maugham, David Mitchell, Colin Tobin, Elizabeth Bishop, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Actors like Samuel L. Jackson, Emily Blunt, Nicole Kidman, Marilyn Monroe. Songwriters like Kendrick Lamar, Ed Sheeran, Carly Simon, Bill Withers, John Lee Hooker, B.B. King. To name but a few, I have a much, much longer list. These are all artists who deal with words on the page, on the stage, in song. Some of these names I'd first heard in speech therapy when I was reassured that people who stutter can be very creative. This seemed to me important because if we can prove that people who stutter are disproportionately dispossessed, uh, sorry, are disproportionately disposed to phenomenal creativity compared to fluent speakers, then we've made an, an important step in showing what I want to show, which is that stuttering is far more than a disorder or a disfluency, but simply a form of vocal and linguistic diversity that enriches our language, our ideas and art forms. So I, I began reading the biographies and autobiographies of every artist who was said to have stuttered, as well as interviewing dozens working today, like novelists Colm Tobin and Margaret Drabble, and poets Owen Shears and Scroobius Pip. I wanted to get beyond the nice but unqualified statement that people who stutter are often very creative and find out how they are creative, in what way their creativity differs from others, and to what extent we can talk about stuttering as more than just a spur to creativity, but a form of creativity in itself. Is it possible, I wanted to know, to even talk about a stutter culture? Here's what I found out. The first thing is that we really do tend to be more creative than neurotypical people. As we navigate the difficulties in our speech, our brains are working overtime. We become linguistically very versatile. One sociologist has described how people who stutter draw on a different sense of space. They have two or three conversations going on at the same time, using different words dependent on which they can or can't say at any given moment. And I, I, I think Jerome talking about the clearing earlier, <laughs> which others connected with, is another really good way of describing that. The novelist David Mitchell, author of Cloud Atlas and many other great books, says that 
quote, your stammer informs your relationship with language and enriches it, if only because you need more structures and vocabulary at your command. All this seems borne out by brain scans, which show significantly enhanced activity in our brains during the act of stuttering. The brain's a muscle, work it hard as we do, and it's no wonder so many people who stutter become creative heavyweights. The second thing I found is, is that this unique creativity leads to art, hence the killer list of great artists who stutter. If you struggle to communicate your thoughts, feelings, and ideas in conversation, they will find other ways to come out. Without my stutter, I could not have been driven to write, says American novelist Darcy Stank. Con Tobin, author of Brooklyn, told me something similar. Being able to pick up a pen and let the words flow was a pleasure and a form of release. This doesn't just apply to writers. Rapper Kendrick Lamar has said, as a kid, I used to stutter. That's why I put my energy into making music. B.B. King said he turned to music so he could talk. Carly Simon, best known for hit single, You're So Vain, says she went into songwriting for the same reason. When she was growing up, she discovered she didn't stutter while singing, so she and her family made up songs to tell each other to go to bed or get up or come to dinner, like the Von Trapps and the Sound of Music. Acting is one art form which seems disproportionately endowed with people who stutter because of the amazing and still unexplained fact that many people who stutter cease to do so when speaking a foreign language or acting. Emily Blunt, a Londoner who is now a major Hollywood player starring in films like Sicario and A Quiet Place, says this. One of my teachers at school had a brilliant idea. They said, why don't you speak in an accent in our school play? I distanced myself from me through this character, and it was so freeing that my stuttering stopped when I was on stage. The third thing I found is that stuttering is more than a spur to art, but informs the sort of art we make. For instance, I found that people who stutter are more prone to what is called graphomania or hyperproductivity. As well as his books, Lewis Carroll wrote over 100,000 letters in the course of his lifetime. And they're not normal letters to an accountant. They're elaborate, imaginative letters full of drawings and poems. Henry James wrote over 20 novels and over 100 stories. John Updike specifically made the link, referring to the, the delight he took in having, quote, managed to maneuver several millions of words in my throat. Somerset Maugham wrote over 30 books of fiction over 30 plays and stories, essays, and memoirs. He's a writer about whom endless ink has been spilled spent in his novels. He wasn't very interested in this though. He tells us very directly, quote, the first thing you should know is that my life and my production have been greatly influenced by my stammer. But as far as I tell, few, if any scholars, have ever bothered to inquire what he meant by this. I also found that people who stutter often develop a unique style of writing that reflects some of the patterns in their speech. Henry James's late great period of writing began halfway through a book called What Maisie Knew, when he went from writing to dictating his novels. His prose style became characterized by the long, florid, circumlocutory sentences he cultivated in his speech to avoid difficult words. These books, like Wings of the Dove and The Turn of the Screw, are considered one of the peaks of the English language novel as an art form. American novelist David Shields gave up writing what he considers the lyric language of fluency early in his writing career and has spent the last three decades creating a fragmented staccato prose style. He told me his most famous book, Re Reality Hunger, is basically a stutter fest. Um, I would... I, Hearing Jerome earlier made me want to find out a great deal more about uh, how how the patterns of stuttering are translated into music, and I was completely fascinated to hear that Jerome can stutter while playing the saxophone, and, and Claire and Mel will also reinforce that point, and I'd love to find out more about this. Um, finally, like David Shields, I found that artists who stutter have a tendency to experiment, to play and mess about with language and form. And Rory Sheridan, who's in on this Zoom, I uh, has spoken to me about this, and I hope we'll talk about it later. 
in, in literature, the most famous example is Lewis Carroll. Like Somerset Maugham, Carroll is somebody whose sexuality is endlessly put under the microscope, but nobody seems very interested in the fact he struggled with stuttering from the moment he could speak to the day he died. He spent months in speech therapy, most intensely uh, just before writing Alice in Wonderland. When she was old, Alice Liddell, the Alice of the title, recalled Carol making the story up on the spot. It was, she said, quote, quietly enunciated in his quiet voice with its curious stutter. In other words, Alice in Wonderland, one of the most enduringly popular books in the world, translated into 173 languages, was literally stuttered into existence. Alice is an experimental work, first and foremost. At times, it is less a story than a series of linguistic malfunctions. When a mouse declares it will tell a long and sad tale, the following page is a concrete poem in the shape of a mouse's tail. The poem Jabberwocky, which appears in the sequel, is made up of nonsense words. It describes a young hero's attempt to slay a beast called the Jabberwock. Carol later explained that Jabberwock means the the result of much excited and fluent conversation. In other words, fluency is the monster in the poem and his defeat leaves us with lovely nonsensical disfluent language. Twas brillig and the slivy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave, or mimsy were the borogroves and the moam raths out grave. Here's a strange thing. Carol's real name was Charles Dodgson. In his letters to his speech therapist, he describes how the hardest sound he has to face is a hard C. He says it is so difficult, he sometimes has to spell out what he wants to say. He calls it, quote, my vanquisher in single hand combat. Yet on taking a pen name, a moment when Dodgson could have chosen any word under the sun, he chose the, the name with the hardest of hard C's, Carol. Is it possible that in doing this, he was deliberately honoring the creative debt he owed to his stutter? Here are two last examples of the experimental turn in artists who stutter. Uh, like Lewis Carroll, writer and artist Brian Catling, author of the Vore trilogy, an incredible series of books, by the way, tells me that his obsession with monsters in both his experimental books and his strange performance art goes back to his stutter, that feeling of struggling through life with a handicap. And the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, who started as a child, refused to give his masterpiece, the, philosophers, the Philosophical Investigations, any order. He wrote it years before he died, but left it as a series of unordered paragraphs and pages at the time of his death. He said, often my writing is nothing but a form of stuttering. So I've argued that stuttering encourages the creation of art and art which sometimes uses story and form to capture some of the experience of stuttering. For this reason, I think we can go further and talk about a stutter culture. It goes back centuries. Until three weeks ago, I thought the earliest artist with whom we can specifically draw a connection between their stutter and their creativity was Lewis Carroll. Then I came across an amazing novel from 1791 by an actor and writer called Elizabeth Inchbald. Not, not only is a simple tale, as it is called, basically season two of Fleabag, and every bit is brilliant, but Inchbald stuttered, and she draws the connection between this and her creative life in the prologue, written in 1791. She says, it has been the destiny of the writer of this story, be occupied throughout her life, in what has the least suited either her inclination or capacity. With an invincible impediment in her speech, she had a well-documented stutter, it was her lot for 13 years to gain a subsistence by public speaking. She was an actor. And it has been her fate to, to, to now devote a tedious seven years to the unremitting labor of literary productions. Stutter culture is more than some fringe minority concern, but encompasses great achievements of the arts, like the Alice books or Henry James's late masterpieces. We find it in the energy of Kendrick Lamar's music and the originality of Wittgenstein's philosophy. But there is one last art form I want to talk about because it is one particularly shaped by people who stutter and therefore central to what we might call stutter culture. And that is the blues. The history of the blues goes back centuries, but it was thrust into the mainstream in the, in the 1940s and 50s, in part because of two musical giants. As I said, B.B. King wrote that he turned to music because of his stutter. 
John Lee Hooker also stuttered, something which he sings about in his song Stuttering Blues. His first producer claimed he only took Hooker into a studio because he was struck by the strangeness of a person who stuttered when they spoke, but not when they sang. As a result of these two musical giants who wore their stutters on their sleeves singing about it, a very strange thing happened. The younger generation of rock and roll musicians who revered them saw stuttering as who would have thought it cool. They integrated it into their music. Think of Roger Daltrey from, this, from The Who singing, why don't you all f f f fade away in my generation. In early live recordings, Van Morrison, a disciple of John Lee Hooker, fakes a long drawn out stutter on the word tongue-tied in his song Cypress Avenue. As he does so, you can hear the crowd go completely wild, cheering and applauding. Similarly, in live recordings of their song Whole Lot of Love, Led Zeppelin's Robert Plant fakes a long stutter on the final B of the phrase, you've got to let that boy boogie. Then he says, I think John Lee Hooker said that. Q, great cheers and applause again. Somehow in the world of the blues and the rock and roll music it inspired, the prejudice against stuttering in every other aspect of culture is inverted. And all because two of its founding fathers stuttered and, and didn't mind talking about it. The blues is a unique, precious example of how we can use art to change not only the experience of stuttering for the person who does it, but the wider social prejudice against it. But in order to make this change spread from the closed circuit of individual art forms and, and genres to mainstream social perception, we need to go way beyond general statements about people who stutter often being creative and make a science of it. We need to argue for the existence of a stutter culture and use the many examples we have to prove it. How amazing it would have been if, if, if someone had told that 12 year old kid agonizing about his speech back in 1988, that stuttering is one of the most creatively enriching traits there is with a long and diverse history of great music and fiction and performance associated with it. And as for the stutter app, a fish called wonder and open all hours, well, who's listening now? Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much there. That, that was an excellent John. Thank you for taking time to speak to us uh, today. We are over time, but um, we have got time for a few questions as always. So one of the things that come through was, um, what has stammering brought to your life in terms of creativity? And do you see it as a positive towards how it's affected your BBC career? I do now. I didn't through my until I um until I did that city lit course and began to and, and and began to think about it and acknowledge it was part of me. I don't think it had. I, I think I spent my twenties and early thirties trying to navigate my life about it and not doing a lot of things I would have liked to have done. Uh, I, I would have liked to have done more in the, in the performing arts, but I never felt I could. Um, but I think over the last um, 10 years, it, it, it completely has. And it's given me a sense of, um, it's given me a sense of calling and purpose and a sense of, um, of knowing what I want to say. And so the fact that I wrote the book, I, I'd never written a book before. The fact I wrote the book is a testament to that. But I, but I think I've also weirdly embarked on a much more creatively active stage of my life in my 40s that, than, than I had been in my 20s uh, and most of my 30s. So there was definitely something about really wanting to come to terms with my experience of stuttering that has triggered a lot and, and it's triggered creative pursuits specifically about stuttering, but it's also just liberated me in other ways. That's brilliant. Um, so Dr. Tom else is asking you, do you think that stammering is a form of neurodiversity and regarding support, do you think it is all similar to that of dyslexia, ADHD, or is it best to separate these? Um, 
for the first point, as I discovered neurodiversity theory about 10 years ago, I became very passionate that stuttering should be looked at through uh, neurodiversity. But because the other thing I was discovering was that, you, you know, our scientific knowledge of stuttering is still fairly limited. And uh, the I, there's no such thing as, as, as a sort of cure. Um, and rather than waiting for a cure to come along, uh, which there's nothing we can do much about, but what we can do is start to um, uh, advocate and change the way society perceives it. And, and, and what I do believe is that most of the so-called problem with stuttering isn't in our speech, it's in the way it's seen uh, by, by wider society. And one thing we can do is work together to change that. That's an immediate tangible thing. And, and, and that's why the stuttering pride movement, which many people here have been uh, actively involved in, is so important. In, in terms of how it connects with other forms of neurodiversity, I believe it, it's very important that we start making those connections. And one of the things I did in the book was as well as uh, talking to people who stutter and writing about stuttering, I also wrote about other sorts of speech conditions because I, I think while uh, different conditions are of course different in many ways in physiological terms and medical terms, they often have similarities in psychological terms, how we're experiencing them and also in social terms. And I believe in strength in numbers and that by forging those networks with um, uh, groups and communities uh, who, who have aphasia or Tourette syndrome or dysarthria, we're going to have more impact in changing, uh, uh, changing mainstream perception. Okay, th thank you for that. Um, we've probably got time for another two questions. And um, we have one here that we is asking, we would all love to see a more nounced and balanced representation of stuttering in the, in the media, rather than the character either being pitiable or overcoming the stammer. But what practical steps would you, would you like to see happen in order to make this a, a, a reality? And what can we do about it? I think uh, I, I think the most practical step is to um, uh, give more space to people who stutter on on broadcast and media uh, platforms. So broadcast as a, as a medium is uh, has been for a long time um, uh, fluency prejudiced. It's um, it's uh, obsessively so. I was very struck a few years ago when the broadcaster Nick Robinson, who was hosting the Today programme, had had a, an operation on his throat, which resulted in a slight bit of croakiness to his voice. Uh, uh, I, I didn't notice it. And it was astonishing how many people began writing in or sort of going onto Twitter and saying, you know, what's happened to his voice? He can't do this job. It, uh, and it, 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 it made me feel... Uh, somewhat ashamed to be that I was working in that industry at the time. What I've been doing the last sort of two years is, is I've become much more uh, uh, activist -y about this, is, been, it, it, it is uh, to commission a, a lot more programmes from people who, who uh, struggle with speech in, in different ways. Um, I think Scroobius Pip uh, has been hugely significant because he's, you know, a broadcaster who has uh, uh, allowed his stutter to be part of his broadcast persona. But I, I think it's it's that but the main thing is ensuring there is space for people who stutter on on broadcast platforms, and I think that needs to come from people like me who work for those platforms. Um, and I think it also needs to come from people who, 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 who feel they ought to be heard, pointing out that it is a form of prejudice and, and ultimately disability discrimination to be uh, excluded from media platforms for having a stutter. And I, I think if it's pointed out, I, I, I genuinely think most people 
in gatekeeper positions in media platforms do not realize they're discriminating. And so, and if it's pointed out to them, I think in most cases, people's better judgment would make them think, think twice. Okay, and finally, I've got a simple question from someone asking, what, what would be your message to your 12 year old self regarding stammering? My message would be um, uh, there are lots of difficult things about stuttering there are, and it's not it's it's hard to get away from that but there are these extraordinarily positive uh, uh, and productive qualities to it uh, to it too and I would talk about uh, and so I, I would uh, tell them that say it, it, it is difficult but there's also these it's a superpower in many ways as well in terms of the empathy it gives you the creativity the linguistic versatility and it's yours that superpower is yours to seize and do something with I didn't for 20 years so there's a Tarkovsky point yeah it's mirror and it's a plot device the the stammer and mirror to answer that question. <laughs> okay, so thank you, J J John Ayr. I think we've run out of time. If you have got some extra time, there are about nine questions on the question and the answering part that you, you could possibly j jump in and answer. And um, I'm sure everyone's got a great insight from you. So I hope you continue with, with all your charity work and stuff and welcome to Stama as a patron and I hope it goes well for the future. Thank you, Jimmy, and thank you, everyone.